the half-breed son of a noted Comanche chief and a white captive, Juana Parker may be the most important American Indian leader many Americans have never heard of. In the first half of his career, he led one of the most fierce and notorious bands of Plains Indian holdouts. But by 1875, with his community's food sources being depleted and land being confiscated by the United States, Parker surrendered and actually helped settle his fellow Comanches, along with Apaches and Kiowas, on a reservation in what is now southwest Oklahoma. He was appointed principal chief of the Comanches by the United States government. A practical man who saw the proverbial writing on the wall, Quanah Parker helped preserve Comanche culture while negotiating a place for Indians in an increasingly white North America. On this State Line History special, the life of a man who, as gently as possible, led his people onto the white man's road. Centuries ago, the land of the Comanches stretched over 250,000 square miles. The tribe followed the buffalo on foot from Kansas to central Texas. Then when horses came to the continent with the Spanish in the 1600s, the Comanches quickly became the greatest horsemen in the Americas. Their freedom seemed as endless as the plains, but the only thing truly endless was the number of settlers and soldiers moving west onto their lands. Fort Sill in southwestern Oklahoma would be the end of the trail for the Comanches. The last band of warriors to come onto the reservation would be led by Quanah Parker, a man who would transition his people from their ancient traditions to a world of the white man's making. He was sort of a man of two worlds. He you know, was the last, uh, uh, he was the last leader of the group called the, the, the Guajadas that came in to Fort Sill and he was the first to pick up uh, or understand the, the demands of, of modern society and I think for that vision realizing that our people had to live in another world that uh, he, he became even a greater uh, a man, he, he had a lot of uh, foresight. Every year, the Parker family meets at the site of Quanah's home near Fort Sill to celebrate their most famous forebear. I think I'm the oldest living grandson there is. I'm 91 years old. It's always a thrill to me, you know, to be here on this ground to celebrate. Well, we do this as, as a annual event, and we believe that by uh, sharing uh, the culture uh, of the Comanche people, and particularly Quanah Parker, to uh, share you know, with, with the world that uh, this was a man of prominence. Quanah Parker's story begins in May, 1836, only two months after the fall of the Alamo. A band of Comanches attacked Fort Parker in the piney woods of north central Texas. Most of the men and women at the fort were killed. Among those captured by the Comanches was a girl with blonde hair and blue eyes named Cynthia Ann Parker. The elder uh, member of the Parker family was killed immediately. Uh, Cynthia Ann, who was nine years old at this time, and her younger brother John, who was three years younger than she were picked up by a warrior, Comanche warrior. The little girl lived as a Comanche, and at the age of 17, she married Peta Nakona, a warrior who would become the leader of the Quahadas. Together they had three children, Quana, Pecos, and Little Prairie Flower. Quana grows to, uh, uh, as a young man, uh, it's very important in, in most Indian cultures, especially on the plains, whether it's Comanche or Cheyenne, uh, Kiowa, that to prove themselves uh, to be uh, considered a, an important uh, 
uh, individual who's making a contribution to the, the tribe to serve as a warrior and you have to prove yourself in, the, in battle. And so very early he began to uh, accompany uh, bands out on the war, war parties that would either capture uh, from w the western settlements of Texas or even as far south as Mexico. And he was a great warrior. I heard stories where he would uh, ride, they would ride, you know, when they were uh, when they were on a raid in a circle around the camp and they, they all knew how to ride horses and they would circle one time to show who they were raiding how impressive they could ride a horse and I think at the same time they were probably taking a chance but instead of going one round around whoever they were raiding uh, probably a camp he would go two rounds so more than the others. Juan Parker uh, he was uh seemed to be a noble, intelligent type of, of warrior. He, he seemed to understand uh, the warfare, to understand the, the enemy, and how he, uh, of course, leading a group of people, uh, women and children, to ensure their safety. He also um, uh, was uh, well suited for battle. He learned all the techniques that the Comanches would teach him. Even though he was part white, he was accepted by the Comanches because of his father. By 1865, white settlement into the Southwest slowed because of constant raids by the Comanche, Kiowa, and Apache. The Texas Rangers were formed to drive the Comanche out of the state. When uh, Captain Saul uh, Ross of the Texas Rangers came up on the camp, attacked the camp, killing mostly women and children. Uh, Cynthia Ann had prairie flower, her youngest child, um, and of course there was a separation at this point. All the men, the warriors, were out on the uh, uh, raiding at this time. So Peyton Nakoda was not in camp and of course Quana was not in camp. Cynthia Ann almost came within a hair's breadth of being killed herself, but when her shawl came away from her hair and they saw that she had uh, blonde hair, uh, cut short uh, and pale, that's when they realized that they thought who they, who they thought they might have found and took her back to uh, civilization. She spent three years uh, before her death uh, in white captivity. She tried on several occasions to escape and go back to her own people because she was more ingrained with the Comanche way of life than she was with the white way of life. When her daughter, Prairie Flower, uh, was only two at the time of her capture, began to be become ill and died in 1864, it was at that point that Cynthia Ann realizing that she would never see her Comanche people again, she basically uh, began to stop eating and, and wanted to die. So she was only, what, uh, not quite 40 some odd years old when she died in 1864. After years of failing to subdue the Indians, Lieutenant Colonel Renald McKenzie was sent by the Army to break the Comanches once and for all. Mackenzie and his men ruthlessly pursued Quanah Parker through Oklahoma, but lost them along the Polidoro Canyon in the Texas Panhandle. He was recognized by his people as a warrior. He had been wounded several times in various raiding parties, including uh, the Battle of Adobe Walls in 1874 in the, in the Panhandle of Texas. There were some enterprising uh, businessmen out of uh, Dodge City uh, Charles Rath and uh, a couple other folks who wanted to take advantage of the southern buffalo herds. They had pretty much, uh, from the early 1870s, buffalo hunters in west central Kansas and, and Nebraska had pretty much decimated the herd. And the last large herds that were to be found to be found in Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle. In 1874, the Buffalo Hunters built a stockade called the Adobe Walls. 
Here they would kill the buffalo, take the hides, and send them north on the Jones and Plummer Trail through what is now the city of Beaver, Oklahoma. From Beaver, the hides would go to Dodge City, where they would be sent on trains to the east. It was a very profitable trade. What infuriated uh, not only the Comanches, but Kiowas and the Cheyennes and Arapahoes was that this was their food source. There were still bands of Kiowas and Comanches that had not been able to be subdued by the military and placed on reservations. And the Quahati was one of those. When they found out that they, uh, there was this stockade being built and that they were killing buffalo, they developed a strategy to uh, attack in late May, early June, 1874, when the uh, Comanches uh, came up onto the uh, stockade and for several days attacked it. It was a well-fortified stockade. There was probably maybe 20, 25 people, uh, mostly hunters, but there were a couple of women. They didn't expect that to happen and because of, uh, they thought they were gonna attack by surprise and it didn't happen that way. And it was sad in a way, he was just fighting to maintain uh, the land and the buffaloes, which was our, our survival for all of his people. And you know, the only way they could, we could live and to uh, survive is just to keep the buffalo and we didn't want people running us off of our land. Well, that's all he was fighting for. In the uh, course of the, uh, the raid by the Comanches and the Kiowas, Quana was wounded. He couldn't believe, we, since he was behind a set of rocks some distance away, uh, that he was shot in the shoulder, but from behind. And he thought this, there might be special medicine that the whites had, that a, a bullet could go past him and turn around and come back and hit him. It remained a mystery until someone realized that it was a ricochet off a rock behind Quana that the bullet came and wounded him. What really uh, caused the Comanches and the Kiowas to leave after several days because they were making no headway as far as just destroying the stockade or killing any other individuals within the stockade was when they were holding a council and Asaya, the medicine man's horse, was killed by a bullet from more than a mile away. And yet there was, they were hidden by a hill and this really perplexed them. And this is what caused them to say they were not gonna be able to attack any further. And so they dispersed and left. After the battle, the buffalo hunters packed up and moved back to Dodge City. Well, that was a last effort of the Indians in that area to resist. They, they didn't really uh, uh, prevail, they didn't win, but they say in that battle that he was, uh, he, he was uh, uh, real brave. And uh, in fact, there's a song that they use about, the, about the, uh, that adobe walls. And that's the song that uh, they, they call it the Adobe Wall song, but see, that was his song that it just somehow protected him from, from, uh, from harm, from injury. General Randall S. McKenzie uh, sent out troops uh, to finally uh, bring in these recalcitrant uh, tribes uh, to subdue them and put them on the reservation. Deep in the Palo Duro Canyon in the Texas Panhandle, McKenzie and his men burned the Comanche camps and shot 1,400 Indian horses. On the 2nd of June, 1875, Quana Parker and his 400 Quaharena warriors surrendered at Fort Sill. Well, there were bands, and bands of varying sizes, 
but each had a head man. But uh, until the tribe was on a reservation and the government wanted to deal with as few people as possible. They said, we noticed one man among all of these chiefs that, uh, that stands out among all the rest. And we would like for, to appoint him and to talk to him and uh, do negotiating through him because he, he negotiates well with his own people and he can talk to them and they'll listen to him. He couldn't be swindled in the same way that Indians who were less educated or apprised of the values, but he knew how to deal with white people. They were camped. They were not uh, incarcerated at Fort Sill, they, but they were close enough where the troops could keep an eye on them. Of course, their horses were taken away. Uh, their armament was destroyed, uh, and so they were issued rations by the military for generations. Uh, and really eons of time, they had roamed freely on the plains following the buffalo herd, but, uh, and raiding uh, and warring against other tribes. They were forced to um, conform to white society. They were expected to have their children go to school, learn English, take up the hoe instead of having the horse, and become farmers, and or learn a trade. Well. What they did ultimately was to divide up the reservation and give uh, somewhere around 150, 200 acres to each Indian. We had always been nomadic people, and the last thing they wanted to be tied down to uh, 100 acres of land and have to cultivate it. He adjusted well from that way of life. I don't know how he did it. He's very, again, it, it speaks well of Qantas, what he, what he really was, a very strong man. Well, he had this white connection, which made him important in terms of dealing with Americans. And once they were put on the reservation, there was nothing that those Indians liked more than going to Washington. You know, they'd go on a train to Washington and uh, be taken out to restaurants and uh, meet prominent people. You know, they were curiosities in Washington. Parker saw the hard road ahead would be easier if he could help his people adjust to the new way of life. He was able to uh, see the handwriting on the wall as far as what, what was going to occur for his people. Parker could not read or write, but he could understand and speak some English and he knew how to make a deal. Well, the cattlemen were losing out in Texas. Settlers were coming in and occupying the land. And so the best land available to them was to the north. Cattlemen that had to drive their cattle to, I guess, to even for grazing, they didn't have no land. So they would just start driving it, looking for land, and they would ask Indian people, you know, hey, this is Indian land, and I guess they thought they could just put their cattle anywhere and let it graze as they were uh, driving them. And so they, uh, the Indians went to the agency and said, hey, you know, they're, it's illegal what they're doing. We're going to start charging them. So Quanta uh, negotiated that with the, with the cattlemen to be able to have leases for all the Indian people to be able to get uh, some price for all the head of herds of cattle that came through. Parker had the cattlemen build him a home at Post Oak Mission. Today, his descendants gather in the shadow of the place known as the Star House. The stars meant to Quanta, it was a symbol status of, of authority, like for the generals, and he admired one of the generals' house, and he said, I would like stars on my house. And so uh, he asked Burnett and him to put those stars on his house. He was very proud of his home, and some of the ranchers helped build that house, and it was like a White House to the Comanche people. At the long dining table, Parker played host to a who's who of history. Quanta was always entertaining, and 
He was very hospitable and he entertained very uh, many dignitaries. Here's a list of uh, some of the people like the British ambassador, Texas cattlemen, kings and army officers, Apache chiefs, Comanche, Kiowa chiefs, and Sioux chiefs. Oh, well, uh, several times he went to Washington uh, and uh, around the turn of the century after 1900, he uh, was introduced to President Theodore Roosevelt and Roosevelt was so enamored with uh, Kwana. Of course, Roosevelt was at heart someone who loved the West, even though he was born in New York State. In fact, visited southwest part of Oklahoma and visited with Kwana in his home uh, near Cache uh, in 1905. So they became friends for the rest of Kwana's life. Uh, this is the old well for Star House. Uh, known as an excellent source of water. It was uh, really well known. People came just to drink this water. The, what is of particular interest here, it's one of the uh, landmarks in terms of the original house location. Around the uh, masonry curb, you can still see his cattle brand embedded in the masonry, the circle within a circle. And the date, 1897, uh, is there. Very nice, very large uh, facility that was uh, used by him as his headquarters for his ranch, his home place. He had seven wives maximum that lived here. This room was occupied by Tanasa, his favorite wife, and some of his, uh, his last surviving wife and uh, some relatives has said that it wasn't so much as that he was that she was a favorite wife, it was that she was the only one that didn't bear children and that was probably the reason why she was able to go a lot of places with him and uh, like to Washington DC and I think she also was a translator. So he dressed her in American clothes and a lot of the pictures that you see are mostly with her. When the federal government tried to do away with polygamy among the tribes, they picked Colonel James Randlett to tell Kwana he could only have one wife. Kwana sagely said, you tell me which one I throw away. And with that kind of logic, the Indian agent never, they never brought up the subject again. He kept his wife, so, um, so he had several and they had multiple children. I always wondered how he got along with all the wives, but he was, uh, they respected him. I mean, he was, you know, he somehow managed, I don't really know. Uh, it's amazing how he had that many wives. He got along with all of them. Quanta Parker is also noted for uh, trying to encourage and get um, into law the Native American church or the use of peyote. And uh, so in 1906, he actually went to Guthrie uh, the territorial capital and address the Constitutional Convention on that issue. I think he brought it from Texas. He was healed down in Texas at somewhere they healed him and he was so amazed by what they did with this peyote he brought some back and uh, that's kind of how it got started. Like any father, Parker wanted his children to be prepared for the future. He was important to him. In fact he had a school right, right down the road there. Uh, the, when they first came in, the children could go to Cass School, so he started his own school. Uh, he served uh, on the uh, Cass's Board of Education, and he just re he, he seemed to to envision the need for in making this demand of, of modern society to to do it the best was to to learn it and to become educated. Family was always important to the last chief of the Comanches, and he never forgot the woman that gave him his last name. A few months before he died, he felt very driven to have his mother's remains removed from Texas. She had been buried in Henderson County, Texas, in a cemetery uh, when she passed away in 1864, along with her daughter, Prairie Flower. Quana and his mother and his sister he never knew are buried at Chiefs Knoll, along with some other notable chiefs of the Plains Tribe uh, on Fort Sale property. When he died, there were no others that took his place, uh, to my knowledge. And it's only been since the early 1970s when the reconstitution of tribal governments and Indian sovereignty has become 
more prevalent that election of tribal leaders have occurred and of course the uh, they don't necessarily uh, call their tribal leader today of the Comanche Nation chief. A grandson of Quanah Parker was a Comanche code talker and landed on Utah Beach on D-Day, carrying on the warrior spirit. Today, the family keeps the traditions alive, ready to pass on a legacy of honor and strength to the next generation. It's just something for us to be able to go out there and gather as family in remembering him, uh, exactly where he lived and what all he saw from his visions, you know, for our people. We go back there in memory of him. And my name is Parker. I, I, I never really thought about that. But you think about my name and how it came about, uh, Parker, it, was, it was, came from a, the girl that was captured. He wanted his mother's name. He took his mother's name, and that's why I'm a Parker. Quanah Parker is not universally revered by Indian people. He drew particular criticism during his lifetime, not only for his close association with people many Indians believe to be their enemies, but for accepting the government's appointment as chief over all the Comanches without being selected by the people he represented. Traditionalists during his life and since his death say he was too quick to lead his people down the white man's road. For a copy of this program, please send a check or money order for $22.95 to the OETA Foundation, Post Office Box 14190, Oklahoma City 73113, or call 800-879-6382.